Good afternoon and welcome. We are still being joined by a few folks, but we are so pleased to be exploring Hillwood's orchid-filled greenhouses with you this afternoon. We'll get started in just a few more minutes as folks continue being admitted. Welcome all. My name is Erin Lurie and I am the head of adult audiences at Hillwood. We are so pleased to be welcomed into your homes today. This is the first of our month long celebrations for Orchid Month. We celebrate Orchid Month in March because it's the time of year when there are the largest variety of orchids in bloom. Drew Asbury, who you'll meet in just a few moments, has been keeping Hillwood's greenhouses overflowing with stunning blooms. I am always thrilled when we can gather virtually and I hope that we have some visitors today who are not in the Washington area, but those of you who are, I invite to come visit Hillwood and see the greenhouses in person. We are open Tuesday through Sunday. We require timed reservations and of course masks, social distancing, all of the COVID protocols you would expect, but we uh, do expect timed reservations to help make sure that we keep that capacity nice and safe. So in just a few moments, I'll turn you over to Drew Asbury. First, I'd like to introduce him. Drew started at Hillwood in 2012, and he is currently our horticulturalist and volunteer manager. He's responsible for the greenhouses, cutting gardens, and the horticulture volunteer program. And today he's going to be leading us through the greenhouses to shed a little more light on the orchids in our collection, as well as our founder, Marjorie Post. As we go along, please submit your questions for Drew as they pop into your mind, the best place to do that is to submit them in the Q&A module. If you tap your screen or move your mouse, you should see the toolbar, which normally pulls up at the bottom of the screen. There's the little one bubble for a chat, but the questions, if you submit them in that Q&A with the two chat bubble, is going to be the best um, way for me to keep track of all of the wonderful questions that we'll pose to Drew at the end. And with that, I will hand us over to Drew. Hey, thank you, Aaron. Um, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's uh, my honor here today to speak to you about just um, one of Hillwood's many traditions, and that is uh, growing orchids um, here on the property. Um, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with us, we are located in Washington, D.C., as Aaron mentioned, and we are the former home of Marjorie Merriweather Post. Um, who not only lived here at Hillwood, but she created Hillwood to act as her lasting legacy and one to be shared and open uh, to the public. Um, and Marjorie Post was a, a mother and a grandmother. She was a businesswoman and a philanthropist. Um, and she was a legendary entertainer. And most certainly what one of the things we're gonna talk about today, she was a collector. Um, so stepping inside the house, I often refer to for first time visitors to Hillwood is a bit like stepping into a time capsule of the 1950s. Uh, visitors get to enjoy her lovely collections of 18th century French decorative arts and Russian imperial arts. But yet you also get to see a fully modern kitchen and butler's pantry um, straight out of the 1950s. So there's a little bit for everyone to see here at Hillwood. Uh, but today we're going to talk about um, our collection of orchids. Um, and here we can see the top left corner here. This is the classic Cattleya or Corsage orchid here. Um, and below we can see there's Marjorie uh, Post herself uh, there on her honeymoon cruise to her fourth husband, uh, Herbert May. And there she is wearing a, quite the elaborate uh, corsage there made out of Cattleya flowers. And so during her time here at Hillwood, uh, Marjorie Post amassed a collection of nearly 2,000 orchids. Um, and she had full-time staff here devoted to the care and maintenance of her collection. 
Um, and orchids would be grown um, in the greenhouses as pictured here on the left. These are some video orchids. Um, and then when they were in bloom, they would most likely be moved into the house um, and put into displays. Um, and there on the right, we can see a picture of her uh, breakfast room, um, which Marjorie Post uh, often dined at. And we can see that is fully decked out with Cattleya flowers, along with some lilies and chrysanthemums in the background. And we can also see Cattleya flowers being used as fresh cut flowers um, in that arrangement there on the center of the table. And so some 50 years later, you know, we are still um, growing orchids and this is the home of the orchids here at Hillwood um, as taken from a photo here from our cutting garden last April. Um, and we still have a collection of approximately uh, 2000 orchids to this day. And uh, when visitors first enter our greenhouse, they'll actually uh, take note that the greenhouse is divided up into five smaller spaces. Um, and what this allows us to do is it allows us to grow a wider range of orchids because we're able to create a wider range of habitats, right? We can adjust the light, the temperature, and the humidity and such. Um, and so we're also considered to be a working greenhouse. And what that implies is that every single orchid in our collection is out for viewing uh, for every visitor every day of the year. Um, and you'll also, visitors will also notice a lot of tropical plants intermingled amongst the orchid collection. Many of these tropical plants will spend the summertime outside mixed in with our seasonal displays. And then everybody gets jammed inside during the winter time um, to stay warm alongside the, the orchids. Um, so in this particular slide, we're actually looking at our two uh, warm growing greenhouses. Uh, these are houses which tend to stay uh, in the low 60s to mid 60s as the minimum winter temperature. And they house our Cattleya collection off to the right here, some different Cattleyas. Again, the Crusage orchid, Marjorie Post's favorite orchid. Um, and these warm houses also house our Phalaenopsis collection. Um, and these are the moth orchids, the ones you see in the grocery store. Um, we have a lot of these and we're going to talk about more of these in a little while. But continuing on with our tour, you know, we have our warm greenhouses and now this is our cool greenhouse. Um, and so winter temperatures in here are kept all the way down to the 40s um, and maybe the lower 50s. Um, and so the trick is, is that, you know, these cool loving orchids, if we were growing these in our warm greenhouses, we might have beautiful foliage and healthy looking plants, but they would never bloom. Okay. Um, so cool loving orchids are a little trickier here to grow in the mid Atlantic because it's, it's not so hard to keep them cool during the winter time. That's pretty easy. It's during the summertime. They do not like our high heat and humidity. But luckily, there's a whole types of tricks that orchid growers grow to still induce these plants um, to come into bloom and, and to be happy, um, happy little campers here in the Mid-Atlantic. And then lastly, if, if the orchids don't belong in our warm house or our cool house, we put them in what we refer to as our intermediate house. And this is uh, kept it during the winter time, temperatures of the upper 50s to maybe 60, 62 or so. Um, and they house our collections of lady slippers, as seen here on the left, they're papiopetalums, um, and then our own sidium collection is, as seen on the right there. Um, and, but in reality, you know, I'm mentioning all these variations in the microclimates of, you know, our greenhouses here at Hillwood. But, you know, the ultimate goal in growing orchids um, for us here at Hillwood, the same as your goal at home, right, is to get these plants to flower, right? And in order to get a plant to flower, the first thing we have to do is grow a healthy plant. And then, you know, in order to grow a healthy plant, the best way to do that is to attempt the best you can to recreate that plant's natural habitat in your home. So we've mentioned a little bit about temperature. That's just one of those variables that we're gonna to try to recreate in our home from that plant's natural habitat. But there's also sunlight, water, um, all types of different cultural conditions. And then our game of being a greenhouse grower or an orchid grower is to tweak those environmental conditions just to the right conditions um, to induce those flowers. So here we are for our phalaenopsis here, and we're going to center in on this one for a little while um, and talk about you know how to get this to rebloom in your home um, yourself. Um, and there is a reason why these are considered the best for beginners, and I agree with that. 
Um, and that's because they tend to be a little bit more flexible in their growing conditions. Um, and they also, their growing conditions align with the indoors of our houses a little bit better, as opposed to trying to grow one of those orchids at once 40 degrees at night during the winter time. Phalaenopsis love 60 to 65 degrees. They're a warm loving orchid, which corresponds to our, our home. But first, before we start talking into too many details, let's think about where these plants are from, right? Phalaenopsis are native to Southeast Asia in warm to hot tropical rainforests and jungles. And they tend to be in these areas where there's a year round even moisture or regular moisture and fairly high humidity, okay? Um, but yet, where they are found in nature, these plants do not grow in the ground like how we're growing our, our, our plants in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, these plants grow as epiphytes, and that is that they are actually attached to trees high up in the canopy, okay? And so this idea of growing as an epiphyte has major implications for how we would then take that plant out of the tropical rainforest and try to grow that in our house, okay? So an epiphyte is a, a picture there at the bottom left corner. There is your phalaenopsis growing in nature as an epiphyte, and you can see there its roots are actually gripped onto the side of that tree, okay? And it starts there as a tiny little seed. Uh, that seed is blowing around in the atmosphere. If it lands on an appropriate branch um, and all the stars align, that little plant will germinate there, and that very first root will automatically start sticking onto that plant, okay, onto that structure that it's growing on, and it'll spend its whole life there. It's not a parasite. It's not taking nutrients from that other plant. It's just using it as a structure to live on, okay? But for a moment, imagine yourself as that phalaenopsis, okay? You're high up in the treetops. Your roots are exposed to the sunlight, to the wind. When it rains, you get poured and drenched on. But as soon as that rain goes away, you're back to where you're gonna dry out fairly quickly, right? Your roots are gonna dry. Um, so the takeaway here is that um, to grow an epiphyte well, you know, we want to maximize the air around the roots as well as the drainage that plant receives, okay? So virtually all of Hillwood's orchid collection are from tropical regions of the world, and about 90% of those are grow as epiphytes, okay? So this epiphyte's a pretty big factor to understand. And here you can see off to the right is how we replicated the epiphyte nature. We have a lot of Spanish moss hanging on here, but underneath that, these orchids are attached onto a piece of wood similar to this. Okay, so how do we recreate that epiphytic nature in our homes, right? Well, you know, very first, your orchid pots, uh, you know, you can have plants mounted onto wood and growing in your kitchen, but it's a bit of a mess, okay? So you don't have to have um, a fancy orchid pot like this one here in the middle. These are designed just for orchids. You can imagine the amount of air exchange between the roots and the outside air here, but please, your pot should definitely have a drainage hole. Um, and then secondly, we grow all of our orchids and predominantly our phalaenopsis in a mixture similar to this over here. It's a very chunky bark medium. And you can imagine for a moment, if you were to take water and pour water on top of that, and that's in a pot, how quickly that water is gonna drain through. Okay, there is that idea of taking that epiphytic nature, but yet putting it in a pot, okay? Um, but you can imagine what happens to that soil after two or three years, that bark starts to biodegrade, it starts to break down, it starts to, you know, uh, stay wet longer, it starts to turning into a little bit more like soil, right? So this is the whole logic why um, orchids benefit from being repotted every two or three years, where you're literally taking that plant out of the pot, removing all that old medium, and then putting it back into often the same size pot, but with fresh chunky medium again. It's all about keeping air and good drainage around the roots of your orchids, okay? And this is such an important topic. We have a whole other program in two weeks that devotes, the whole program is devoted to repotting. But this is, I think, the biggest takeaway um, for a newbie, and it's the, my most complicated slide of all today. Um, but I think it's important to understand that orchids all grow on a one year annual cycle. Okay, so we're going to kind of zoom in here um, and look at this annual cycle for a phalaenopsis. Okay, and so what this slide is trying to show us is that there are certain times of the year where all orchids, but in this case a phalaenopsis, there's a certain time where it grows new leaves, there's a certain time it grows new roots, there's a certain time that it kind of chills out and relaxes and just sits for a while. 
And then there's a certain time of the year that it blooms. And once you get your Phalaenopsis or any orchid onto its cycle, you, these things will happen the same exact time every single year. And it's really the water, light, and temperature are the three main cultural conditions that help that plant figure out where it should be on the cycle, okay? So for instance, during the warmer months of the year where there's a longer day length and temperatures are warmer, well, that translates into a plant that needs a little bit more moisture, okay? Um, and higher humidity, right? And then the opposite is true. During the colder months of the year, there's less daylight, right? So less hours of light, there's slightly cooler conditions. So there's slightly less water too, right? So those are just three environmental cues that are helping that plant decide where on that cycle it should be, okay? So our job again as orchid growers is to tweak those environmental conditions just so, so that eventually as you see that spike initiation is there between fall and winter, right? So what can we do all year to create that spike initiation? The worst thing to do for an orchid is to put it into and grow it in a static environment. And I often think of like an office environment that has, you know, maybe it's artificial light on from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day, year round. It's 72 degrees at day and night, year round. Um, and, you know, maybe it's just you're watering it once a week, regardless, year round, right? That plant's not re receiving these stimuli to know what to do. Okay. So let's look at a little bit more detail of these three environmental stimuli that I think are most important for all orchids. But again, we'll just focus in on the Phalaenopsis. Um, so watering, most frequently asked question at Hillwood is how often do I water my orchid? And that's a very complicated answer. And it's, it's not an easy answer. So if I only have a moment to speak to someone, I'll say, well, a good place to start is once a week. But truly it depends on what season is it, right? How much sunlight is that plant getting? What temperature is it getting? You know, what's it growing in? Is it growing in a barky medium or is it growing in sp a sphagnum moss? As seen here, many of the orchids from the grocery store are growing in sphagnum moss, which that stays moist twice as long as bark, okay? So what's more important is the technique, right? Whenever your orchid is gonna be watered, this is my kitchen sink at home. This is what I do. I put all of my orchids in the sink, um, I take the little shower attachment and thoroughly soak down all of those plants. I cannot overwater at any given moment. Um, but then the trick is, okay, again, think of it as an epiphyte hanging up in the air. Those roots want to go dry before another thorough soaking occurs. Okay. Um, so summer months, warmer temperatures, longer day length, more water. Winter, less light, less temperature, less water. Okay. And then lastly, I'm not a fan of the ice cube method. I'm sure there are some of you out there. If you've not heard of the ice cube method, you don't need to know about it. But those of you that do and it works, that's great. But yet we're trying to replicate a plant's natural habitat. Um, instructions to, to water your orchid with two ice cubes a week. Um, you know, those plants are not accustomed to having ice water on their roots. They're from tropical rainforests. So I just prefer the old fashioned uh, water with room temperature out of the out of the sink. And then light. After water, light is the next most common question. How much light do I give my orchid? And again, this also depends on which type of orchid you have, but we're just talking about Phalaenopsis now. Phalaenopsis are considered um, low light orchids in the relative realm of the orchid world. Um, so here at Hillwood, we're actually looking here on the left, this is our Cattleya collection, and you can see all of this bright sunlight coming in, okay? Well, our Phalaenopsis are actually on the other side of this bench, which faces to the north, and you can see we have this extra shading up here. So for us, the Phalaenopsis are grown in the absolute deepest shade of every orchid um, of our entire collection. They're, the, they're in the deepest shade, okay? But the struggle with telling somebody to say, hey, put your orchid in an east window is that the east window in my house is different than the east window in your house. The idea behind it is that, you know, uh, an east window gets a little bit of direct sun early in the morning before it's too hot. And then the rest of the day, it's just bright and direct light, okay? I generally, most homes do not have enough light for that orchid to be outside of a window location with the exception of this, this image off to the right, a random image off the internet. If you have that amount of direct sun coming in where you're creating these distinct shadows 
well, you probably could grow a phalaenopsis out on this table, but most likely I would grow plants right up in the windowsill. Okay. Now, intensity is important. If you're going to grow your plants outside, like you can sunburn your plants, right? So it's a gradual acclimation to a higher light condition for sure. And for phalaenopsis, since they are low light, certainly beware of hot direct sun um, for extended periods of time, particularly during the summertime. Um, so again, just like with light, I'm sorry, with water, there are also seasonal variations with light, right? Um, and this is just one of those environmental cues that we can help that plant figure out what to do. Again, one of those things that it does is bloom and lights one of the triggers, okay? And then lastly, the last big cultural requirement is temperature. You know, we've already talked about, you know, Hillwood, we have different houses that were considered warm growing houses cool growing houses, intermediate growing houses, you know, phalaenopsis, love the warmth, okay, um, and this implies that year round they should be kept at a minimum of about 60 degrees, but here's the trick everyone, okay, um, it's fluctuations in temperature, particularly a chill during the fall season um, is probably the easiest way um, that a home orchid grower can encourage their plant to rebloom, okay. So I just mentioned that we keep our fowls at about 60 to 65 degrees year round minimum. Well, I lied, okay? We intentionally in the fall, we turn the thermostat down about 10 degrees. So, and the same time of the year that you're at home and you're opening your windows in the fall and all that cool air comes in, right? And you wake up and it's kind of chilly in the morning. Well, that's what we do in our greenhouses here. And what that does is that makes those plants realize that that warm growing season is over, right? It's time to kind of rest and to stop growing vegetative growth, stop growing roots, rest a bit, and maybe begin to start thinking about flowering, okay? But yet at that time of the year with the fall chill, we're not only giving it a chill, well, that's also the time of the year that the day length is getting shorter and shorter and shorter, right? Um, and then maybe we start restricting watering a little bit, right? So it's all three of those variables that we're playing, okay? That it's in order to get that plant to encourage it to rebloom. Um, and many people will summer their plants outside as well, or people have found like a cool uh, sunroom or a room that had naturally cool, or can you crack your windows? You know, these are all different ways to provide this variation in temperature over the course of a year. Um, but again, phalaenopsis are the easiest to promote to reblooming, and they don't necessarily need such strict things. But um, you know, um, if your phalaenopsis at home hasn't bloomed within a year, it's a good idea to move it to a new location where it receives different environmental stimuli, most likely more sunlight or more light, or a space that actually gets a little chillier in the winter. So lastly, just looking back at this cycle here, you know. Um, Again, all plants, every orchid in, in our collection has its own cycle. So, you know, this may appear complicated, but the idea, you know, is how do we recreate that plant's native habitat? How do we then tweak those conditions in our own homes and climate to encourage that plant to be onto a cycle? We can also now look at when's the best time to repot. Well, that would be right there at the top of the cycle there where growth starts, right? be right about here is the time to repot when we're entering into that warm season, right, of active growth. Down here is where we put that fall chill in just before the spike initiation, right? And so again, this is our ultimate goal is growing flowers, getting that plant onto a cycle and doing everything we can as a gardener um, to achieve that goal. And so with that, I thank you for today. I would love to invite you next week at this time is Orchid 101, which is, uh, we talk a lot about the same conversation we're having right now, but we expand it and we're gonna add in things about fertilizer, pest and disease. We'll talk more about humidity. Um, and then we're also gonna talk about getting the cattleya to rebloom. And it's a great comparison. The phalaenopsis and the cattleya are really too widely uh, variable uh, with culture wise. Um, and then in two weeks, as I mentioned, we'll have an orchid repotting class. It's all about orchids. So at this time, we have tons of time for questions and answers. And um, back to you, Erin. Thank you very much, Drew. And we are starting to get questions, but there is always time for more. So please feel free to submit things using that Q&A module at the bottom. Um, 
we've gotten a couple of questions, Drew, about mealybugs, particularly when you have just purchased a plant, often from a, a grocery store or something like that, and that once they bloom, the there's an infestation and how to get them to... Um, how to clean them up? Yeah, how to clean them up. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I would argue that most of those, if, if you're buying the Phalaenopsis at the grocery store, I would say most of those come out pretty sterile. And I would worry more about bugs if you have other plants at home or if you have a wider range of, of, of plants. Um, and yes, mealybug and scale are the two major pests in our collection. So there's multiple techniques to go. Um, what our We have a whole team of volunteers and we have staff devoted to our orchid collection too. Um, our go-to for mealybugs, it's a couple. Um, if we have the time and it's just a few, um, and if you just have a few at home, it's really just a bottle of rubbing alcohol, uh, the 70% alcohol um, dipped with um, using a Q-tip that you dip into that alcohol and you can literally just swipe off the mealy bug. I mean, it's time, time you know, and repetitive, but um, you know, if you were doing this once a week, every week when you watered or so that you inspected the plant and wiped them off, it's not a one-shot deal. Um, also at Hillwood, and we'll talk more about this next week, uh, we release um, a lot of beneficial insects in our greenhouses. Um, our, our orchid greenhouses are about 98% organic, so we aren't really using very many traditional pesticides anymore, but instead we're releasing beneficial insects that then eat, uh, you know, they spend their whole life searching around the greenhouse uh, looking for little mealybugs to eat. So um, yeah, alcohol and beneficial insects. Mary Slimp asked, if you buy an orchid that comes in only moss, should you immediately transfer it to a bark medium or when is the time to do that? Great question. So yeah, when you first buy your orchid, I would not immediately do anything to it. Like enjoy it because it's probably in spike and bud. That's not a good time to transplant. Any trauma or fluctuations the first thing that plant's gonna do is abort its flower bud. So let it be, enjoy that plant while it's blooming. And then the question is, it's really up to that individual greenhouse grower. I'm old school. I've always grown my orchids in a bark medium. Andrew Beatenball, our orchid specialist here at Hillwood, he is a fan of orchid bark. Previous growers have been a fan of orchid bark here at Hillwood. That's kind of what we like to do. That sphagnum moss, I think, is, is the mass-produced phalaenopsis that are shipped around the world. And imagine trying to ship pots of loose mulch around the world. Like the, the plants would be all over the place and unpotted. So I think that's why they're so popular. But there are orchid enthusiasts that grow in moss. So the trick is I would wait about a year, right? Um, and then repot in the spring just when you see signs of a new leaf or a new root that's a perfect time to know that plant is gearing into active growth. Then do your repotting if it's not in bloom and you see signs of, re of new growth. And then yes, at every home improvement store or, or you know, big box store online, you'll find orchid growing medium that's bark or orchid growing medium that's moss space and they both work. But you know, then, you, then you change how you water a little bit because the moss does stay wet a lot longer. Julie Mack asked whether we should all be looking for orchid food, if there's a type you recommend. Yeah, these are all fantastic questions that we're going to talk about in Orchid 101. So, uh, but yes, now if you just have one orchid at home, is it worth, like, yes, if you want to do everything you possibly can, there are fertilizers uh, designed and marketed for orchids. But generally being an epiphyte, right, these plants are growing up in the air, they're considered to be, you know, very low, uh, low fertilizer requirements, okay? Um, so most of the formulated orchid fertilizers on the market tend to be very, very weak. Um, so you would just follow labeled rates. Where it might get dangerous is if you use a traditional miracle Grow or something that's not related or not marketed for orchids, you may burn your plants because the concentrations are too heavy. So, uh, Yes, during periods of active growth, those warmer months where we're getting it more light, more heat, more water. Yes, fertilizing is amazingly, will, will make your plant bloom much better. Maybe instead of having three flowers, you have eight flowers because you fertilized every other week all summer, right? 
So fertilizer is great. We fertilize about once a week at Hillwood during the growing season, but we might not fertilize at all during the months of January and February. So yeah. it's all about that annual cycle. Verity mentioned that their orchids flowered in February after two years of no blooms. Oh. So they wonder if they've confused the orchid as to seasons or any other insight you might have. So very good point here. I was really referring to the cycle of a phalaenopsis. I'm not sure if this orchid that bloomed in February was a phalaenopsis. It could be any, you know, there's so many orchids. They all have their own set season. It's just like Aaron mentioned, in March is when we have the largest amount of orchids in bloom because our entire collection got that chill in the fall. And then it takes them a couple months to realize that there has been this chill. And then they set bloom and it takes a month or two for the Phalaenopsis spike to grow out and to form buds. And that's why for, for us, you know, actually most of our Phalaenopsis are just beginning to pop open now. And it's really April is probably more the month for Phalaenopsis. But yet Cattleyas, we've had Cattleyas blooming in December, January, February, March. So again, it all depends on the orchid. What I would suggest that maybe they did is maybe it took an entire year to get onto a cycle. If you've only owned it for a year, there's a good chance that plant might have been growing in the southern hemisphere, which means that its annual cycle, it's, it's flipped six months. So who knows <laughs> what environmental stimuli encourage that plant to bloom. But what I would suggest is they, they have it in the right spot. If it bloomed now, most likely it will bloom next February as well. Um, and they found a really good window in their home. And enjoy the blooms while you can. Yes. Um, Judith asked where other than grocery stores and American plant are there um, places where one can find orchids and yeah. whether you recommend folks consider having um, grow lights at home to help supplement winter light needs. Okay, so where to get orchids and grow lights. So we'll talk a little bit about grow lights in 101, but I've, I'm a window grower, right? But there is a whole nother there are orchid people. Andrew has orchids in his basement under artificial light. And nowadays that world of artificial light is all converting to LED and it's, it's scientific, right? So uh, there's a lot more valuable uh, knowledge online rather than me rambling on. But yes, you can certainly grow under artificial light. I would recommend to keep it corresponding to our natural daylight so that those variations in light I think is important um, for the amount of hours. Um, and then where to purchase orchids. Um, yeah, in this region, what before my time here, I'd heard of Kensington orchids, which was in Kensington, Maryland, which was supposedly like the, you know, the, the most wonderful place um, in Washington, DC. So nowadays there are, uh, I hear a lot of people talking about Trader Joe's, seems to come up a lot that they have good deals and they sell things that are not phalaenopsis, but I'm not a Trader Joe's person. So I haven't really seen that myself, but that comes up a lot. And then it's the high-end local garden centers, right? Um, and then the other way to do it would be to Google orchid shows. And every year, you know, COVID days, it's a little different, but the US Arboretum, Brookside, there's multiple, the Capital Orchid Society, they all put on orchid shows different times of the year where they have vendors that come. And then it's like a marketplace of, you know, a, a, tons of temptation. Um, and then the place that we like to go to, we actually drive all the way to Atlantic City, uh, Waldor Orchids, or a place by Lancaster called um, Little Brook Orchids. But, you know, it's a, it's a hike for us if we want to go actually hand-picking orchids. Um, there, there, I've not found anything that's truly right here in the metro area. Uh, Diana just mentioned that there is a beautiful orchid shop in Vienna, Virginia. Um, so if for those of you in the Virginia suburbs, that might be a good place to look up. We, uh, Mark asked a question that is way outside my area of expertise, which means it may be best for one of our upcoming programs. But Mark asked if you had any techniques for cloning plants uh, uh. and said that they had no success with Kiki paste. Um, now that is a, that's a, yeah. Um, no, here at Hillwood, that's never been part of our mission. Uh, it was never part of Marjorie Post's mission to hybridize. Um, but yes, uh, orchid enthusiasts um, uh, can, uh, 
orchids very easily hybridize closely related species. Um, but yet that process can take, especially if growing from seed, can take um, you know, up to a decade from the process of getting uh, an orchid capsule to form of seed and then growing those seedlings out to see what the, 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 you know, your progeny is. Um, kiki paste for us, we, we, kikis are little baby plants that often form on the stems and it makes clones of the plant. For us, we don't intentionally try to make kikis um, I, often a kiki forms when a plant is upset for one reason or another. Um, so that just happens. So for us, we normally try to avoid creating kikis and we rip kikis off because we want to keep the mother plant as the thing. But, you know, it depends on which type of orchid you're growing too. A lot of orchids like cymbidiums that we're looking at here or the cattleya, those grow as kind of like our perennials grow in the garden. They get bigger and bigger and bigger on rhizomes. So you split them and divide them into pieces as the way to, that's how we multiply our orchids. Um, but we're also, we like to buy new ones too. We're always looking, you know, always looking to add to the collection and, and diversify our collection. We got a question about what to do if you've got plants that are stored in a pot with other plants. Mm. Um, so should they be removed about. or separated? Is this talking about like if you get a gift often they'll have like three or four plants together in one pot maybe? I think that's, yeah. I, you know, I've never been a big fan of those. I think they're great for a temporary thing. Now, if it's all tropical plants and they all require the same conditions, then you could probably keep them in there for several years, but eventually somebody is going to outgrow and outcompete somebody else. Now, when there's an orchid put into the mix, I think that's even more troubling because again, orchids are epiphytes. So if it's growing in with a little palm tree or a little a fern or something, well, those don't have compatible watering regimes. Um, so I would separate the orchid out. Now, what you can do is you can have one big container and then three or four smaller pots inside there that then as you go to water, you, you deconstruct that every time you want to water and then you put them back in as your, you know, as your display. But generally, I'm not a big fan. Hill, here at Hillwood, it's one orchid per pot, um, one tropical plant per pot. Um, you know, we don't really intermingle too many things unless we're outside for summer and we're doing a temporary display where we jam all things together, but it's always temporary. We also got a question about what the best way to handle the bloom spikes is once the blooms fade and fall off. So I, I believe we're referring to the failing ups again here, and we get this question a lot. Um, you know, let me let me get my prop here. Um, good old phalaenopsis here. Okay, so here's the plant, right? And then there's those flower spikes. Uh, generally, I recommend just to cut when it's done blooming and the tip here turns tan. Sorry, the tip at the end turns tan. Generally, I would just take my scissors and cut this stalk all the way back to where it's coming out between the leaves, okay? That's gonna be what helps that plant stay on that cycle and then gear up, you know, a year later to do the same thing over again. But what happens is what you can try, if you have a happy, healthy plant, um, you can take your scissors and cut off here, which is right below where the first flower fell off, and you would cut this one here. And often in four to six or eight weeks or so, sometimes off one of these lower nodes on the stem here, you can sometimes get another little secondary shot of a few flowers, okay? This is really easy when you're growing in a lush greenhouse condition and all the conditions are so lovely and rich and the plant's really vigorous. In the home, I would avoid doing that. I don't do that at home. When I've tried at home, they don't normally do it, first of all, my ones at home, because they're not as vigorous as the ones growing in Hillwood's greenhouses. So yeah, cut it down here or cut it right here. Terrific. Well, I want to respect everyone's time. I see that we are at 2.08 now, um, but for those of you who still have orchid questions or as you come up with more questions over the next week, please join us next Thursday at 1.30. Drew will be going into Orchid 101, which will cover all of these and more. 
Um, and then on March 25th at 1.30, so again, that's two Thursdays from now, we'll be going over how to repot. And he's gonna be doing some demonstrations of a variety of different plants um, with some pointers to guide you at home. So thank you very much for joining us for today's tour, a uh, virtual tour of Hillwood's greenhouses and learning some of Drew's tips of the trade. We hope that those of you who are in the DC area will be able to come and join us soon. Come enjoy that luscious greenhouse while it is absolutely bursting with blooms. And those of you who are not in the area, please come and join us online as the month continues. Thanks all. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.